Good morning. Well, it's a really great privilege to be able to talk this morning. Um, and really, I just want to share some thoughts that I've seen as I've read a passage of Scripture uh, that have really challenged me and have encouraged me. And, and my prayer really is that that will do the same for all of us this morning. If you've heard me speak before, there's a verse um, I will guarantee you've heard me mention. It's one that's really had a big impact on my life um, over the last, I guess, 10 or 12 years. And it's in Isaiah 40 verse 9, and it says this, you've got good news. So go up a high mountain and in a loud voice say to your city, here is your God. Make God visible. Make him known. Good news is something that we shout about that we publicize. And we say, come and see what I've discovered. Something that's made a difference for me, come and see how it can make a difference for you too. And in the days when that passage was written, maybe that was the way you got your message out. You went up a high mountain and in a very loud voice, you spoke something and you said, come and see what I've discovered. Today, it looks different. We don't have to go up big mountains and in loud voices. We can get messages out Millions of people incredibly quickly. We can use poster campaigns and social media. We have means of getting a message to a really big audience really quickly. So much has changed. And yet I think the effective way hasn't changed. I think that's still the same day 2,000 years ago. One conversation with one other person and telling them about the Jesus that you've come to know. And so today we're looking at this series and we've called it Courage and that felt like a good title a few weeks ago. I think in the last 10 days we have seen courage completely redefined as we look at Ukraine and we look at the incredible courage and the strength of that country, that nation, their people, their leaders. You know, telling someone about Jesus is not an act of courage. It's something that we are called to do it's something that is the calling on all of our lives. In fact, it's the only response there can be to us knowing we have received good news that we might go and tell someone. And it may be that, you know, very recently you found for yourself, maybe in one of these online times that we have, maybe in an in-person gathering, you've heard clearly how much God loves you. And you've made a very simple response. You've just said, thank you, Jesus. It may be that you've not read the Bible. It may be that you don't feel you understand a lot of what that means from what you said. That's a whole adventure you've still got ahead of you, and we've all got ahead of us to still discover that. But it doesn't stop us having a story to tell when we reach that point. And we could say in a simple way, thank you, Jesus. We have a story to begin telling to another person. And so we're going to look at some stories in the Bible over the next six weeks or so of people who told others. And if you've got your Bible with you this morning, then you may want to look at John chapter 4 with me. And I'm not going to jump around this morning to lots of other passages. I really just want to look at this story. And as we just go through it, take some points that we can see. Um, if you're looking online, there are some notes there with 10 simple points that just looked... I looked at and saw from this story that might encourage us. If you're taking notes, there'll be just 10 simple things to write down. And it may just be that of those 10, there's one or two that for you this morning, you sense God is saying that to you. This is the thing for you to take away today. You know, of all the stories in the Bible of Jesus meeting with people, encountering people, this one is the longest account that we're going to look at today. There's 42 verses on this story. It's the story of Jesus meeting a lady, sitting at a well, telling her things about her life, telling her things about who he is, and her understanding something for the first time, and going and telling others. The longest account there is of Jesus having a conversation with another person in the whole of this chapter. And so for that reason alone, maybe it's worth us looking at this morning. You know, the story begins in the first three verses, and it says that Jesus had learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more people than John. Although, in fact, it wasn't Jesus who baptized, but it was his disciples. And so he left Judea, and he went back to Galilee. There's a lovely little phrase in that, and sometimes we can read the Bible, and we can 
we can sort of pass some of these phrases and not realize what they say. And there's this line here which says this, that it wasn't Jesus he was baptizing, but it was his disciples. I want you to note the first thing here. Followers of Jesus do the things that Jesus does. It's so simple. But it's really clearly here. Jesus' followers have begun doing the things they've seen him do. It seems so simple. Followers of Jesus do the things that Jesus does. There's a passage in John 14, a little later on, where Jesus basically says that same thing. He says, what you see me do, you are going to do. And Jesus is having a conversation with his followers. And they say, show us the Father. We want to see God visibly. And Jesus says to them, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because everything I've ever done, everything I've ever said has been the Father at work. You have seen the Father. And guess what? You are going to do the same, and even more, even greater, because I'm going to the Father and I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. Everything you've seen me do, you are going to do. There may be a question you've got, you know, are there two kinds of followers of Jesus? Are there those who do the things that Jesus does and those who don't? Well, no. What does it say here? Followers of Jesus do the things that Jesus does. And so Jesus goes on and he goes into Samaria and he comes to a town and there there's a plot of land where Jacob had given to his son Joseph and there was Jacob's well. And Jesus is tired, he's had a journey, he sits down by the well, it's noon, it's lunchtime. And a lady comes, a Samaritan lady, to draw water. And Jesus says to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy some food. Let's just note this from this part of the story. Jesus meets this lady in an ordinary, everyday moment. This conversation, this isn't a church service, this isn't a special event. This conversation is just an ordinary, everyday moment, a conversation at a well. Now, we don't often go to wells today. That's not how we go and get our water. Uh, but what would be the equivalent? If we look at this story there and we bring it to today, where would this conversation be happening? Maybe it's happening in a coffee shop. Maybe it's in a pub. Maybe it's in the football game. Maybe it's on a train or a bus when you're travelling from place to place. Maybe it's when you're walking the dog. Maybe it's on your work Zoom call. Maybe it's when you actually are in the office. Uh, maybe this is at the school gates. Maybe it's in a supermarket queue. Maybe it's a conversation with a neighbour. Maybe it's a telephone conversation. What does your day look like? What would an ordinary, everyday moment look like for you? I think we'd all agree we are not short of opportunities, yeah. of moments yeah. in the day. But how do we start our day? You know, many years ago we had a, a couple in the church, Peter and Jean, and some of you will know them. Peter's no longer with us. Uh, he's with the Lord now, but they used to meet here and we used to do a prayer meeting on a Sunday morning. They always told us this story that they never started a day without first praying and giving themselves and that day mm. to God. I wonder how we start our day when we look at our schedule and we think of that list of things we're going to do and the places we're going to go. Do we ever give that day to God and say, God, in these opportunities, these everyday moments today, what does it look like if we give ourselves to you and that day to you that as followers of Jesus, we want to do the things that Jesus does in our ordinary, everyday moments? And what does that look like when we begin to make that a pattern? And the Samaritan woman says to Jesus, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? We're not supposed to be associating with each other. There's these two groups of people. Not only is he a man and she a lady, uh, but actually these are two groups that didn't get on. And here is Jesus having a conversation with her. I'm reading a book at the moment called Irresistible by Andy Stanley. And there's a quote in that book, and it says this about Jesus. It says, he didn't just have a new message, and it wasn't just that that made him irresistible. It was Jesus himself. People who were nothing like him liked him. And Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. Jesus invited unbelieving, misbehaving, troublemaking men and women to follow him and to embrace something new. 
And they accepted his invitation. Jesus likes people who are nothing like him. Sometimes God uses the most unlikely people to tell. And sometimes he uses us to tell the most unlikely person. You know, a few years ago now, I met a young man who was coming out of prison. If you look at our website, you'll see that we run City Changer projects. If you click on that, you'll see a range of projects we're involved in. Very big, some are very small. One of them is caring for prison leavers. And there's been about four or five people over the years where I've had conversations with people. And one of those was a young man. He'd come out of prison. I met him at the gates as he came out. He'd been in prison for six years. And we were getting him to his various appointments in those first two days that he came out. And one of them was to a job centre, but his appointment was miles from where he was now living, where the prison was, and we were late getting to the appointment. In fact, we were 10 minutes late, which considering the journey we'd had to do across London was pretty impressive anyway that we got there. Um, but when we got there, they refused to see us because we were late for the appointment. And so we went across from that job centre and we sat to have a coffee to think, what do we do now? And a man came to sit next to us and he was drunk. And I looked and I thought, he looks like he's going to start a conversation. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm ready for this right now. And he's, I was like, no, no eye contact. Let's not look at him. Let's not invite him into this. And, and he began a conversation. He said to me, do you go to church? And at the time I said, yes, I do. And I'm part of a, a team that leads a church. And then he said to the young man with me, do you go to church? And he said, no. He said, why not? He said, I've not been able to. Why not? just come out of prison and then this man began to tell his story of how he'd been in prison and how he'd come to know Jesus and it was an amazing moment yeah. and I was sitting there thinking the most unlikely man the man I'd almost wanted to move away from suddenly tells a story about the Jesus he has known who's met him in a particular way in a particular place that says something to this young man that I could never have communicated because that was not my story Jesus likes people who are nothing like him. Jesus uses the most unlikely people to tell, and sometimes he uses us to tell the most unlikely people. We move on in the conversation. And Jesus says to this lady, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So the woman says, you've got nothing to draw water with, and this well is too deep. Where are you going to get this living water from? Do you think you're greater than Jacob who built this well, who drank from it, and all his sons and all his livestock? Jesus has sowed a seed. He's said something about this living water and it's given a reaction. It's almost as if this lady's sarcastic. She's being uh, facetious almost. Him saying, I'm going to give you living water. And she's saying, well, well how are you even going to get that? You haven't got a bucket. Uh, how are you going to get that? Do you think... You're better than Joseph, or Jacob, who built this well. You're saying you can do something that even he couldn't have done? You know, this lady's not used to having a conversation with anyone, let alone a stranger, a Jew, a man. And it's as if her defence kicks in. I don't want to be here. She doesn't want to be here. I don't want to be talking. I just want to get my water and go home. You know, she's coming at that point in the day because there's stuff in her life that means she's not involved with other people. And she doesn't want this conversation. And here's someone saying, there's something I can do. There's something I could give to you. Someone's given some time. And I think it leaves her with a question in her mind, which is this. Are you for real? Are you for real? I'm not sure anyone's had a conversation with this lady. You know, don't always expect an instant response when you have a conversation. But do expect that God might put a question in someone's mind. And I think for this lady at that time, she's got a question. Are you for real? Jesus answers and says, everyone who drinks the water from this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I'm going to give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will be in them like a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman says, Sir, give me this water so that I don't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw 
water. The woman listens to this offer that Jesus has made of living water. And he's got her attention. He's used this phrase, living water, it's used in the Old Testament. I don't know whether Jesus is referring to an Old Testament scripture when he says this, but in Jeremiah 17, it describes God as a spring of living water. And it reads this, if you read this passage in Jeremiah 17 from 6 to 13, it says, those who have turned away from God, it's like they're living in a desert, in a parched land where nothing lives. But those who trust in God, it's like they're a tree being planted by a stream and their roots find water and are evergreen and there is no fear of drought. How does that description sound when you look at this lady's life and her situation? Here she is in the heat of the day, isolated, alone, no friends. It must be a bit like this, living in a desert, in a parched land where no one else lives. And here is this description of God being like a spring of living water. You'll be planted by a stream. Your roots will find water. There will be evergreen. There will be no fear of drought. And she responds and she said, if I had water like that, I wouldn't have to keep coming back here. I don't think she's talking about just coming back to this place to draw water. But you remember her situation. She's isolated. There's shame for some reason we don't yet know. We're going to find that in a minute. And so she's going back to this place. And her pattern every day is not to just get water, but it's almost to go over and over and over. Those things in her life which stop her moving forward. What are the things that we go over again and again that stop us moving forward? Are there things like that in our lives? Are there repeated patterns and places that we think, God, you know, you can't use me. There's this stuff that I go over and over again. In John 7, Jesus says this, If anyone is thirsty, let them come to me and drink. He who believes in me from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He's speaking of the Holy Spirit who is going to come to those who believe and receive him. What stops us moving forward? For this lady, there's a pattern every day. She seems to go over, she gets water. She reminds herself of things in her life that stop her moving forward. And here is Jesus saying, inviting her, come, receive living water. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit, come, that water will flow from you. You are going to be a source of refreshing for others. And then Jesus continues her conversation, his conversation with her. He says, go and get your husband and come back. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands. And the man you now call your husband, or the man you are now with, is not your husband. What you've said is true. And the woman says, I can see now that you are a prophet. You know, Jesus meets her where it matters most. The issue for her and how she feels about herself, he meets her right at that point that matters most for her. At the core of her shame or whatever else she is feeling, he meets her where it matters most. And then they have this conversation that goes on. They talk about the place where they might worship. What's the difference between the Jews and the Samaritans? You know, you claim this place we worship, we worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, you know, you, there's a time coming when it's not going to matter whether we're worshipping on a mountain or in Jerusalem, it's not going to matter. There's a time coming, and it's here now, where worshippers, true worshippers, are going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for that's the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit. His worshippers are going to worship in spirit and truth. There's a point here where she brings all of this, and he makes it all about him. Come and see what I'm going to do. Come and understand who I am. Let me help you cut through the confusion and the division. It's not about doing things this way or that way. It's about knowing Jesus. I wonder if you can see the journey that this lady has been on in these moments as she's met with Jesus in just an ordinary, everyday place. And he's spoken to her about things that are stopping her moving forward. He's addressed the very core of the issues that matter most to her. And he said, it's really all just about knowing me. 
knowing me, not about ways of doing things, just knowing me. It's as if there's layers of things that are just being peeled away from this lady's life, and she's seeing acceptance that maybe she's never seen before. And then the disciples return, and they're surprised to see Jesus talking to this woman. But they don't say, you know, what's happening? Why are you talking to her? And says so she leaves her jar and she goes back to the town. She leaves the jar of water. Do you know the one thing that she came to that well for was to get water? That was the whole purpose of her going there. She's left it behind. It's as if that doesn't matter anymore. What has she received? She's received living water in this place. She's not going to let anything hold her back. I don't know how big the water jars were that they were carrying, but she knows I need to go from here back to the town and tell everyone what's happened. I'm not going to let anything hold me back from doing that. She leaves the jar of water and she runs to the town. I'm making that bit up. It doesn't say she runs, <laughs> but she didn't want to have anything hold her back, like carrying a jar of water. This lady who's been hiding away this lady who's been avoiding conversations and people, this lady who knows no one is going to listen to her, is running with some incredible news that she has received. What holds us back? What holds us back? Is it past? Is it things that stop us moving forward? Is it things that we hold on to? When we just need to understand that Jesus just wants to meet us where it matters most. Is it confusion when we just need to forget things we don't understand and make it about Jesus and just knowing him personally? When we've said, thank you, Jesus, we each have a story to tell. And the woman goes to the town and she says to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. You know, this is the only person, the only Jesus you can tell about is the Jesus you know. You know, I can read about her historical person, Jesus. I can learn about a Bible book, Jesus. There's a song I recently heard, and it has a line in it which says this, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. There's only one Jesus I can talk about, my Jesus. The only Jesus you can talk about is the Jesus you know personally. The Jesus who knows everything about you and he meets you right there. Why would we make it any more complicated than that? Let me tell you about my Jesus. It says then that the people from the town made their way to him. And many of the people from that town believed in him because of what the lady had told them. Come, she gave an invitation, come and let me tell you about my Jesus. He told me everything I ever did. And so they came and the woman, they said to the woman, we now no longer believe just because of what you have said, but we've heard it for ourselves. There is always a response to a question. I wonder what people's questions might be. Could this be the Messiah? Jesus, are you for real? Can I really be loved by God? Can I find healing from my past? Can I trust in God and find living water? Many people believe because of this lady's story. They had met Jesus for themselves. You know, when we think about this story and we look at this lady who had this courage to invite, she hadn't just completed a year's mission training at Bible College. She hadn't done a six-month you know, remote learning course on how to share your faith. She hadn't read a book on how to tell others by the most popular author. She hadn't even listened to a short sermon series at Dr. Deo community church on how to share her faith. Her training, her equipping, was a chat in the middle of the day with Jesus. You know, when I was um, a child, I, I was invited if I would like to know Jesus. And I want to show you how simple it might be to tell my story. Can I tell you about my Jesus? As simple as it takes just for a match to burn. What, maybe something you want to do today. And for me, it might have just been like this, that as a child, someone told me that Jesus was my friend and he'd be with me wherever I was, and I've known that to be, be true. Mm. You know, as I was a teenager growing up, I went to a church service, and I was given an opportunity to say, 
Jesus, you gave your life for me. I'm going to give my life to you, that every part of my life will be yours. And as I've got older, there's been things in my life I've not always got right, but I've known God has never stopped loving me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Come on. <laughs> Let me tell you about my Jesus. What a great thing that we can do in the middle of the day, have a conversation with Jesus. To find the story of the Jesus I know that I can tell someone else. God bless you. Let that be encouragement today. Wow.